Karen Shigaki. I am Zooming to you from Seattle, Washington, unceded Duwamish land, and I'm really excited to be able to interview Sharon Yamato today. You probably know her writing um, from Janum's Museum Magazine or from the LA Times or from the Rafu Shimpo. Shimpo um, for which she writes a regular column. But today we're going to talk about her work that she finds more challenging than writing, and that is her filmmaking. Um, and there are a lot of films, so we're going to just dig right in. I want to start by um, reading this beautiful piece of prose that's on Sharon's website. It goes like this. I went to Heart Mountain to tear down some walls. Now I gently embrace them. I am a writer and filmmaker dedicated to sharing my ancestral history of the World War II incarceration of Americans of Japanese descent so that this dark chapter in American history be never forgotten nor repeated. My work is about discovery, reconciliation, and resistance. I want to discover what happened to my Japanese American family and others like them to reconcile why my parents and others never spoke about it and to be a voice of resistance to overcome the struggles they and others continue to face. I just, I think that's really beautiful. And um, I will start sort of our conversation by saying that Sharon and I are camp friends. We're sort of descendant camp friends, meaning that we're pilgrimage junkies, I would say, both of us. And the first time we met was when Sharon came to the pilgrimage that I help run, which is the Minidoka one. And um, she presented the film Moving Walls. And I know, Sharon, that you have called this project life changing. So I thought that would be a good place to start. Absolutely. It, it, is, it was the project from its initial stages back in the, I hate to admit how old I am, but in the 90s um, started this project. Um, getting back to the fact that we are pilgrimage junkies, however, that it, it has the, the whole notion of going back to the site of where our ancestors were incarcerated has been incredibly powerful for me. And I never would have thought that before I became involved in, you know, discovering things about our history. I never would have thought that actually being at these sites would mean so much. But you, Erin, are a, a, a monster person who, who really um, furthers that idea by working on the Minidoka pilgrimage every year. And it's, it's a fantastic pilgrimage if you guys haven't been. It's this year was probably one of the best, right? Right. You have to agree. Um, so anyway, I do. Um, but actually, my first experience um, in, in in actually going back to a campsite was when I volunteered to help move the, the barrack that is currently at the Japanese American National Museum back to Los Angeles from Heart Mountain from the heart camp at Heart Mountain. Not only did I get to like breathe in the dust and the dirt of the horrific place we were in, but I got to talk to all these Nisei men who were working so hard. I mean, so hard. These were like six year old men climbing on roofs, trying, you know, pulling apart wood pieces and doing all of this really heavy work because they felt it was so important for them for us to preserve the story of what it was like living in one of those barracks, one of those awful, awful barracks. And they really opened up for me, which was another thing that just was astounding because my parents never spoke about camp. And these guys didn't either. I mean, they had never talked to their own children. I mean, I, I, it was so amazing. Now, we're also talking about the 90s, okay? So back up, I think people have opened up a little more. This is this was a time when it was still rather shameful, and um, they just didn't talk about it. So it was incredible to stand there in the dirt inside one of these horrible buildings and have these men 
I mean, almost they broke down, in fact, you know, just saying that I remember it so well. And I remember that light bulb and I remember that single, you know, that the stove in the corner and that was it. That actually enhanced experience for me. So it wasn't just going back at that point to the camps, but it was actually being there with a group of Nisei men who had never been back before. And um, so that was definitely life changing. So in answer to your yeah. question. Was, yeah, and I mean, that I think relates really well to pilgrimages, right? Like the power of our bodies being in those places and, you know, with that architecture um, does does something. I think it really activates memories and um, can unleash, you know, these emotions in a way that, you know, just talking about it can't. So. I really appreciate you sharing that because I, I don't I don't know if I quite remembered that about your you know the process of the film. Um, I think I, I wanted to say one little thing too because you know you and I I just barely was not actually a camp survivor. I was born a little after camp. You a lot later, um, but not having been in camp, but having that silent story that sort of you know a little bit about as you grow up it, I think in some ways it's harder for us to sort of understand or you know just visualize or whatever we just I think in some ways and there were several sansei who worked on that project and I talked to them about it in some ways it's almost harder because you really do imagine the worst because you don't really know um what exactly went on and all you can think of is oh my god once you're at that site and you see how horrible it is you know and you um, you imagine you know arriving in this train in the middle of the night and the dark and the wind and all that it's it's right it's it's truly horrifying so we really need to talk about it more and I think that was sort of the beginning for me which was really amazing I recognized that, you know, my imagining of what my family went through is incremental, kind of just to protect myself, you know, it's, it's, it's hard terrain, but I, but I realized I'd never, it had never occurred to me, oh, my aunt and uncle, probably not my dad, because he was a real small baby, played, I know they played in this swimming hole, and just to like, let myself have a little bit of space to picture them there was very moving you know mm -hmm. um so each time i go back there i think i am able to cover a little more ground um that was a little bit of a segue I am um or not no not a segue because i, I want to ask one more question about um moving walls i wonder if you could talk just a little bit about what you discovered between, you know, the tensions between Japanese Americans who had lived in the barracks and then these white pioneers who kind of swept in afterward um, and had that sense of ownership over so many of them. Gosh, I, I have a, a hundreds of stories about this, but um, I'll try to think of just a couple. Um, so as the story goes, I went back. Luckily, I met this wonderful photographer, Stan Honda, on that first trip to Heart Mountain. And I went back, uh, I think it was about seven or eight years later, because I was so intrigued by the idea of after the war, these barracks, hundreds of them, there were like 400 barracks and pieces of them were, were transferred all over the Wyoming landscape. And so they were given to these people who were homesteaders, who, you know, basically white farmer types who came in, given free land and a barrack. Well, actually, they were each given two barracks. They had to pay a dollar each for them, but they were given these barracks. And so they lived in them. And their overwhelming um, response to me is that we couldn't have lived in this area had it not been for those buildings because it's freezing cold in the winter and it's constantly windy and dusty and dirty so if they had to live out 
you know, out in the open, they could not have survived. So they were really grateful in a lot of ways to Japanese Americans for the fact that they were able to use the same buildings that we live, that our ancestors, ancestors lived in. But as I got to know them, and they were all really nice, I mean, super friendly, I think. It, and we're talking about the heartland of America, where, I mean, I grew up on one coast. I know, Erin, you've spent time on both coasts, where the thinking is a little different with the heartland of America. I mean, I can't tell you how many gigantic, I want to say that the, the our former president's name was all over the landscape. It was at a time when he was he was running for president. So anyway, that and and when I sat down and talked to some of the people that because we we became rather close. I mean, I was really trying to ask them a lot of very personal questions about how they grew up. And two things I really noticed is one, they really believed that the camps were set up for our protection. They had absolutely no doubt that had we not had those camps, we would have been, you know, roaming around. <laughs> people shooting at us. I don't know. But it, even though you can tell them that, okay, why didn't more things happen? I know there were incidences of, you know, violence against Japanese Americans during that time, but 120,000 Japanese? I mean, that's that would have been something if there were violence against that many people. So anyway, that was one thing that they absolutely um, were, were dead set on. And the other thing, that that really got me was that they really hated it when I called it a concentration camp because they really want to believe that these camps were pleasant places. <laughs> it's a sense of, I think, guilt, somewhat a little bit of guilt, but also, yeah, they don't want to be thought of as the bad guy, you know, the bad guy who imprisoned all these Japanese Americans. So they, they, I mean, one woman actually had said to me when I was working with her, because she was giving me all these pictures of her family and doing all, she said, I'm really going to help you, support you. I really think this is great. She called me like late one night and said, when she saw that I had named the book, Con you know, America's Concentration Camp, she was livid. I mean, basically told me she was not going to tell any of her friends about it. She didn't want not want to have anything to do with it um, because she just, I mean, that one word really made her sick. And I, I, I do think that it had a lot to do with um, a sense of guilt. And, you know, that's really digging deep. But there are, it is a very, very racist area. I, I'm certain of it. I mean, they had no problems referring to us as Japs. Um, in one of the interviews, I had one man even say, oh, well, you know, back then, oh, he was telling me this great story about how he befriended the guy who lived in one of the barracks, and they became really close friends, like fellow farmers and everything. And he said, you know, even though I served in the military, and, you know, back then I thought, oh, the only good Jap is a dead Jap. I mean, he's telling me this in this interview, and then he says, "But we're, but you know, we, yeah, I didn't even go hunting with him today." So he had sort of like, I mean, he, I think, you know, on some levels, he was really trying to, you know, say, "No, I'm real, I'm a really good guy." But on another level, it was like he still, I think, there was definitely that part of him that had to really rationalize, you know, that why we are different or why we are not as different as as he thought we were you know so anyway that and so I had to really kind of reinforce myself against that term because I did hear it a lot so you know then you came back to the Minidoka pilgrimage uh this past July to do a collaborative presentation with Ken Mochizuki about Michi Nishiura Weglin. And I love that film so much. And I just want you to be able to have space to talk about why you decided to make a film about Michi. Okay. I am so grateful to you again, Erin, because this little film, Out of Infamy, has been 
buried under all the Japanese American films in for the for the last year, 10 years that have come out. And it's a wonderful film, if I do say so myself, because it did actually win an award at Tribeca. And it's short, very short, it's only 15 minutes, but it it's the story of someone that we as a as a community, as a Japanese American community, should not forget. She's that important to our community and to our whole concept of what the incarceration was about. You know, she was really one of the first to tell us that it wasn't her fault. I mean, she really, through research, she went through all the National Archives. She did all the work so that she could explain to people that we don't need to feel ashamed about it. It's really the government's fault. And she did all the research to make that available to people. I read her book when I was just out of college and it was, it, I was riveted. Your next film was about a young Nikkei named Stanley Hayami. Can you talk to me about who he was? The thing that really made his story so important and so actually easy to make a film about is that he kept a diary. And that diary is like one of the most important artifacts of the Japanese American National Museum because it's really a day-to-day -day account of what it was like being in camp at Heart Mountain. It's hard to make up stories like Stanley's because he was such a charming young man and he ends up in the 442nd, which is a whole nother story. And and so it's a natural transition for a camp story. And, and it's so engaging that others have jumped on it to like, we, I just helped with a virtual reality piece that is called The Life in Pieces that is, again, it's Stanley. It's Stanley's story um, and it's brought to life with, if you wear these headsets, you can actually go inside the barrack that he lived in. So it's an, it's an incredible piece and it's, um, it's sitting at the Japanese American National Museum. We're trying to get it, others to see it because it's really wonderful. And it's his story again, a natural. So yeah. Yeah. What do you want to just tell us kind of a, a couple things about why you found him so engaging? I mean, I, I know what I think that the art is incredible and I really appreciate that you all brought that to life. And I, I can't wait to see a life in pieces. Um, absolutely. And one of the things that made it so great, I mean, again, in addition to the writing, the, the story is told all in Stanley's words. We were able to animate some of his drawings, which are really, I mean, they go from kind of cartoony, but hilarious. I mean, he had, he had a sense of humor and he did all these little cartoon drawings that, that, you know, made perfect visual material for a film. Um, and then he also, you know, when he wrote letters home from, from overseas in Italy, he would draw these little pictures of what he saw. It was, it's just, it's really amazing. But then he took our classes in camp, which is, which is great. Cause he really, I mean, he brags about, it. he says, I'm going to be the greatest artist that ever lived. And he took these art classes and you can absolutely see his talent as it evolves, as he's in camp. So he was a special human being and, and the war really was tragic for people like him. I always think about when I screen it sometimes, people in the audience say, you know, can you imagine if you were alive today where he would be? And it's, it's I mean, it, it's, it's hard because camp, I think, destroyed a lot of lives, even though they made it out of camp. Um, so who knows, but he was, really full of talent so that's that was stanley and he his it's so exciting that he's living on through all of these um you know books films vr pieces it's kind of like i i wonder if you would have ever guessed how famous he he's become <laughs> so anyway it's yeah. a great yeah it was, it was a great vehicle and and fun fun in the sense that he it, it was very easy to relate to him in, in so many ways so and it's great for young people because he was only 16 when he when he you know had to when he went to camp and then 18 when he was drafted and it, it's a it's a it's a great story about camp that, that young people can relate to yeah I think these um 
these pieces that are you know cover the teenagers and what they're really thinking or have been particularly moving to me you know because we can all remember that moment it's such a <clears throat> so full of like weird developmental milestones you know and then to be in the environment of a concentration camp for them is just so jarring but I, yeah I really I really appreciate the the work that you did on that film um and hopefully he I'm um, hopefully Stanley or his spirit you know is witnessing it all <laughs> so too all right Sharon I want to spend the most time on your upcoming project one fighting Irishman Wayne Collins and the Renunciants first let's take a look at the trailer in America, our land of the free and home of the brave, there have been times when our democracy has failed us. It happened in 1942 when more than 110,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry were forcibly removed from their homes and imprisoned in ten remote and desolate concentration camps. Only one attorney stepped forward to defend more than 5,000 Japanese Americans driven to renounce their United States citizenship after being placed in this human pressure cooker. It would take him 23 years to restore citizenship for nearly all of them. That man was Wayne Collins. If it weren't for Wayne Collins, I might not be standing here today. Just two weeks before my mother, an American citizen born in the USA, was scheduled to board a ship to Japan, Mr. Collins stepped in to stop her deportation. He filed a lawsuit against the United States government. It allowed her and thousands of other Japanese Americans to stay in the country of their birth. As I learned more about him, I came to feel that he was maybe the most important civil rights lawyer that nobody had ever heard of. I was wondering, uh, would you mind if I uh, taped our conversation? I don't care what you tape. You can tape okay. any damn thing you want. I express my views of judges and courts and presidents <laughs> right. in, in unmistakable language because I portray yeah. the sons of bitches okay. for what they really are. Well, his family background was Irish. What can I say? You know, they're going to fight for what they thought was right. Oh, he was an Irish man. Irish, he had a hard temper. <laughs> Civil rights leader Edison Uno said, if you haven't met Mr. Collins, you haven't experienced the bitterness of 110,000 evacuees in one fighting Irishman. <laughs> The story that I want to tell about Wayne Collins, even though he represented people like Fred Korematsu, he represented Iva Toguri, he, he was a man who was really infuriated about the incarceration of Japanese Americans. But the story that I'm focusing on in this film is his, his unbelievable work in helping more than 5,500 5, individuals get their citizenship back after these are american citizens held in camp they renounced their citizenship in the last like year of camp and he came up found out about it and said there's no way you know that you you got because once the, the war was over they all wanted to stay here that uh, most of them had never even been to japan they were American citizens. And, and at the end of the war, they were being asked to be to they were being told that they would be deported. So Collins jumped in to say, no, that's not that's not going to happen. So he took literally 23 years of his life defending more than 5,500 people um, individually to try to get citizenship back for each one of them. And it, it was a uh, as he would say, a hell of a, a hell of a fight. I mean, it, he did so much work. Um, I mean, the 
reams and reams of paperwork that he that crossed his desk is it, it's mind-blowing really mind-blowing when you think about doing pleadings and um affidavits and filing papers and getting letters from over five thousand people individuals that he had to process he he had a staff of japanese american assistants most of them I think maybe a couple of them weren't but he had women working for him to help him with the paperwork but he definitely he was he was the powerhouse behind and and he was an uh an individual lawyer in San Francisco uh but he worked also with the Northern California ACLU and that was um again another story that I'm trying to tell in this film that has really um not been told and and it it has to do with his the conflicts that existed between the JCL, the National JCL, the Northern California ACLU, which is the the um, group that Wayne Collins worked, and the National ACLU, which was against the work that he was doing to help these renunciants. The story of what happened at Tule Lake is so complicated mm -hmm. and so full of misinformation that a lot of former Tulians don't I mean talk about my parents who didn't talk about camp they really don't want to talk about Tule Lake and so for years it was very hush hush you know they didn't want to admit they were at Tule Lake it was such a stain on them I mean you didn't most people didn't admit you know when everybody always says what camp were you in that's the common question and it, they most people, as someone told me the other day, they either didn't say or they lied. <laughs> they did not yeah. want to say they were from Tule Lake. So there's a big, you know, like cloud over Tule Lake that we're really needing to to dig into. And I don't think we as a Japanese American community have done it. Um, I think we are still telling the overview story about, you know, there's 10 camps and this is what happened. And, you know, we were all taken from our homes in Pearl Harbor and blah, blah, blah. I mean, great, because a lot of people don't know that. But there's so many layers to the story that haven't yet been told. You can't understand it if people aren't talking about it. And one of the things that people don't like talking about is that there was a pro-Japan faction at Tule Lake. And I'm sorry, but they existed. And they were tormenting some of the other incarcerees. And it was scary. And, you know, I know that we haven't talked enough about the fact that the people were there were there for no good reason. And that it was really the government's fault that they were there. And that that's absolutely true. But once they were put in this human pressure cooker, there was all kinds of things that went wrong. Every camp has its stories that need to be told. You know, every camp has other, you know, has layers of of, of things that that I think we have to dig deep to find other stories. So I'm, you know, I think the dark side of camp is important to, to talk about. I appreciate that um, about you and other people that are doing work. I mean, I think it's incremental, right? I do. I think it's a long time coming for sure, but I also understand why it's been kind of such a slow rollout of all of us trying to to dig in and also and particularly get at the hard the hard stuff of course that terrible things happened because we were humans and we were in concentration camps and pitted against each other and just all the ingredients for you know the worst of um human nature to be revealed right you know there's there's certain there's various levels of emotional um i guess response reactions um it's funny now you know because I've been doing this work for so long I remember when I first started doing it literally I would start crying the moment someone put a microphone in front of me I could not get through a talk without breaking down and crying oh, wow uh, but luckily I guess 
for better or for worse. I don't know. Now I I only cry at certain spots. I, I don't cry the whole speech through where I can't talk. Um, but I think, you know, again, it's it's being able to learn about these things that is really good for our emotions. You know, it's good for us. It's really good for us. And I here I am, you know, call me a shrink. I <laughs> but that, that's I know my my friend who's a therapist would agree <laughs> that <laughs> you can't stuff your feelings and expect them to uh yeah, go away. So yeah. that's <clears throat> sort of how I, you know, that sort of drives me a little bit. Still. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And then finding that balance, right? Like, did was that a challenge in working on this film because you had to deal with so many really heavy aspects? You know, like that's how I kind of regulate myself in my work, trying to hold on to, um, you know, the the joys and the sorrows. And, and maintain a balance did you find that was also the case with this this film and telling a particular part of the Thule story well absolutely I mean I think I mean you're right I mean we can, can't all it can all be dark and awful but I I again this Wayne Collins was truly uh a hero uh an, a very complex hero a very enigmatic hero, but he was a hero nonetheless, and he was such a light, you know, he was really someone who fought so hard, you know, in spite of uh, <laughs> all kinds of obstacles. I love, you know, I, again, I, because my film is so short, there's so many things I couldn't put in it. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you all the things I had to leave out, but one of the things his son told me that was just so moving was that um, I wish I think he'll be able to tell the story better. But when he after his father died, he opened up this book and his father was this. Uh, I mean, he read all the classics, right? Socrates played all the Greek and Roman classics. So he found a book and, and his son also is very prolific. He's an incredible reader. But anyway, he opened up this book on his bookshelf and he found this note that his father had written to him that said, see page 43. And this was after his father had passed away. And the page referred to this quote. It was in Plato's Socrates. Plato wrote about Socrates' apology to the to the um to the people because he was actually eventually arrested and killed by the government but he it's an apology saying um that i am not sorry that i did not stoop to any state power or government that i was never hired by any state or power you know or government otherwise i he couldn't have done the work that he did in protecting people and that's he stood by that you know Collins didn't care who he offended in the in in the powers that be, because he was so adamant about protecting Japanese Americans. It was such so important to him, um, you know, to his dying day. And he, you know, carried heavy grudges against a lot of the organizations that he felt were not protecting the Japanese Americans. So he 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 really was a principled man. And I think that is, you know, it's it. It takes that kind of person to do the work he did. Okay, so then to wrap up, um, before we go into the Q and A with you, um, I know that you're working on a website project about the assembly centers. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and how that work is going? I'd love to, um, because again, you know, we it's amazing all the things that we we have yet to talk about and strangely enough the assembly centers are very little you know they've they're really there's been no focus on them in terms of you know doing work about what was going on at the assembly centers which some people would definitely agree that they were way worse than the permanent camps um and that's one of the reasons that attracted me to it because they were temporary they were horrible they were built in like a matter of weeks they were put together. It's 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 
mind blowing <laughs> that they were able to imprison all these people in, in such a short period of time. Um, so thanks again to um, Brian Mia, who was the one who really came up with, or he reinforced the notion that there needs to be more work done on the assembly centers. Um, that Dentro, Dentro actually has done quite a bit. In fact, most of the work, most of the information that we're referring to comes from their website. What we are doing, which has really been kind of fun and interesting, is that we're going to every single site and see what exists there today. Um, again, I have this wonderful colleague, Stan Honda, who is like the best photographer in the world. And he's been taking these great photographs of memorials of just the area that they're in. We're doing some drone footage as well and talking to people who were either incarcerated there at one time or um, are involved in maintaining them as places that we need to recognize. And so there's a lot, most of them actually do have memorials. There's only a few of them who which have nothing um there and there's there are people who are still working on that so that's been that's been important I think because I think we it's amazing because most 16 of these assembly centers are in the state of California so they're literally you can drive to all of them in a day almost and so um but you, you can't, they're you don't know where they are you don't know you know what's there today so we have we actually had to are trying to figure out point out exactly where they are so the people can actually visit them if they want to. Um, but the thing that I found great is that each one has had interesting stories that I, you know, unless you're a local resident of that area, you're not going to know. Like there's one um, in um, Stockton, there's this gigantic building there that was actually the hospital that they used during the assembly center period. And it's now this warehouse and who knew but the the fascinating thing about it was it was actually built by farmers like six months before they opened the assembly center so these farmers built this incredible building and then six months later they were incarcerated there so it's kind of like the ironies are so amazing and they're trying to preserve it because they think you know it's one of the few remaining buildings from the from the assembly center period um but you know again that takes a lot of money recognition whatever but it's it's an incredibly beautiful building um I think we have pictures of it but that it to me is just interesting to find out that there are still things there at the site well thank you Sharon for talking to me and for putting this together with me for Tadaima and um we're gonna follow this up with a little live q a that's going to involve a film giveaway of um, some of sharon's films so hopefully you all will stick around for that part all right thank you so much sharon here's part two um, I think we should just keep going. And you actually uh, referred to this in our talk, um, just about all of the things that you had to leave on the cutting room floor for the Collins film. I wondered if you wanted to go through a couple of those things and someone in the audience also was curious about that. Um, it's funny, my co-director, editor, and cinematographer, Evan Kojani, actually made it worse because he actually gave me a list of all the things we left out. <laughs> it was horrifying. Um, but um, I, I, just one that pops in my mind, because you were there, Aaron, when we taped it, was an interview with Stan Chikuma about the JCL resolution that was recently passed that was a, supposedly an apology to the Tule Lake resistors or the Tule Lake uh, renunciants, but um, uh, it it got a little watered down when the JCL presented it, when Stan and you know committee presented it to the JCL, even though the resolution passed. So I was hoping to get into a little more detail about that, and we we couldn't because it was just so complicated. Um, 
one other thing about Wayne Collins that I think I wish that we had included, but we, yeah, anyway, he, um, and this is, this may be helpful in terms of question about his motivation, but he, he really, um, he befriended a Japanese American family um, from his, from his youth. I think he, he met the, he met the, the father, his name was Senri Nao, um, who had a, uh, antique store in San Francisco. So uh, Collins apparently met him. There's a little controversy as to when he met him, but he was, I think, in the military at the time. So he was young. Anyway, he befriended him. And they became lifelong friends. And I think they ended up, this family ended up going to camp. And I'm sure that might have had some effect on, you know, his motivation. But, it, you know, it's hard to say because we've been we weren't able to ask Wayne himself. And the other thing that was wonderful about his relationship to Senri Nao and that whole family is that his, his Nao's daughter became um, Collins's chief assistant, um, a woman named Chia Wada. And I was really sorry that we couldn't include her. So there's, there's a lot that we couldn't include. Um, but hopefully, oh, and the other thing that we I didn't mention in, in in the in the presentation that I really feel like we need to is the in, the amazing work that was done by the Tule Lake Defense Committee. Uh, so it wasn't just Wayne Collins doing all this work; he had the assistance of a committee that were um, incarcerated at, at Tule Lake. They formed, and in fact, they were the ones who hired Wayne Collins. Um, and a man named Tex Nakamura, who's in the film, uh, uh, you know, in a few spots, but he became uh, Collins's colleague. Uh, he eventually got his own uh, law degree after camp, but he was encouraged by Collins to continue the work. And he really helped Collins in locating a lot of these renunciants. So I wish that we could have spotlighted him a little more, but he is in the film and he does comment about the kind of man that Collins is. One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so that says to me, it's really the power of relationships that he built um, really helped him stay so resolute, even though I don't know, it's funny, we I don't know if we can point to anyone else who was so resolute for so long <laughs> about something like that or about working for something, you know, outside of your own community. Um, I, I just think it's fascinating. I'm so glad um, that you've done this work. Um, Let's go with a couple other questions and please feel free to add your own questions to the chat. Um, here's a little, perhaps one that, that people will want to, to know about. Um, what was it like to work with the great George Takei? <laughs> Everyone wants to the answer to this question. Um, I have to say, I, 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 I did know George from a very, I, at my very first job out of college um, was at KNBC. And at the time he was the host of a show, of a show called East West, a big favorite, right? Um, but he, he moderated this program about um, all things Asian American. It was, it was ahead of its time, but it was also a time during which the, FCC was regulating programming so that we could have more diversity in local programming. Um, the regulations have since ceased, so um, there's no need for that anymore. But, uh, well, I'm sorry, there is a need for it, but they are not being regulated, so they don't do it. Um, but uh, I was al I've always been impressed with his devotion to the Japanese American story. Um, you know, he is, thankfully, probably our biggest celebrity. Um, he is one who's outspoken and he is dedicated to sharing the story. And I, I really admire that about him because especially when he started talking about it, it wasn't necessarily a popular subject. <laughs> Nobody was really talking about Japanese Americans in camp when he started. So anyway, getting back to the question of what it was like working with him, I have to say he is really conscientious and he wants to make sure the story is told right. So we had two recording sessions with him. The first one was like a week before he was leaving for London to do allegiance on 
the London stage. So he was pretty busy. Um, but he called me, you know, before when he, I, uh, he always had, had to read the script. He always had comments on it. He made corrections on it. He was really um, like involved in the story. Um, the second time he re we recorded him, he actually got, was adamant. I mean, he was really very, um, wanted to make sure that the loyalty questionnaire was explained in detail you know, not sort of gone over it. And one of the things that I, when I first approached the subject of the loyalty questionnaire was it's it's a complicated question, but it is talked about quite a bit. So I didn't want to go into too much detail, but George felt that it was really important. So he, you know, kind of added words to the script to explain it more more uh, carefully. So, I, you know, he, he is incredibly, dedicated to telling this story and the fact that his own mother um you know was a victim uh and a spot both his parents were victims i think really makes it uh, much more important to him um mm -hmm. so i i really appreciate his his you know i mean when you think about it how many japanese american celebrities are there who take as much time and effort to talk, to tell our story. There, I, I don't know how many, you know, especially his age too. Mm, it's true. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say that's one of my favorite parts of the film is um, how you did insert Tets Kashima's mm. powerful words about the loyalty questionnaire. So Everyone, you'll have to check out the film if you want to see that, see how that plays out. We'll give you a little teaser. <laughs> yeah, very good. Powerful pro. Thanks. Thanks, Tets. <laughs> the great Tets Kashima. Right. Um, here's a question from Steve Nagano. Did you include the letter from Collins to the JCL when JCL wanted to honor him? Steve, that is such, you know what? I have to tell you something funny. So I saw Steve a few was it a couple of weeks ago? And he mentioned this letter to me, which of course I'd seen because I was able to go through all of Collins's documents. But he made such a point about it that I thought, you know what? Maybe I should stick it in there somewhere. You have to kind of look for it. It's not real obvious, but it's there. So Steve, you have to see the film and look for it because it was your encouragement that got me to put it in because it's a really angry, typical Collins, angry at the JCL for what they didn't do. Um, it's a, it, 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 and it's because, you know, he was asked to speak at some JCL convention and it, the, the reaction was absolutely not. There's no way. Why would he, I even consider that? So there's a whole, um, the conflict that Collins had with JCL is really fascinating. I, I think that that's, that's, is again, an important part of the film. Hmm. Thanks. Here's a question from James Okamura. When and how will one finding Irishman be available? Yeah. How do we, he says, how do, how do I get the DVD? But you're going to have a series of screenings, I assume. Yes. Hopefully if all you out there, I hope we get to go to all your cities. Um, but as luck would have it, James, we are <laughs> producing them even as we speak. I'm, in fact, I'm picking them up on Friday in time for the screening on Saturday, our premiere with, with George Takei and Wayne Merrill Collins in the discussion afterwards. But anyway, we're, I, I really, it was like close to the wire, but I made, I wanted to make sure that we had DVDs for that screening. So they are now a I mean, you can even try ordering one. I hope it gets through, but we have, I did set up a, a website. It's called waynecollinsfilm.com and you can order it online. Now there's a little confusion because we just set it up. So when you order it, my web designer made it go into a different website. <laughs> anyway, you will get the, the Wayne Collins film if you order it on that website. Um, so that is, um, 
in process, but we're definitely going to have them for sale. We, you know, DVDs are a dying breed. So I had, I was conflicted as to whether to, to produce them or not, but uh, happily there have been a lot of people who requested them. So I'm happy to, that they're going to be made available. Oh, good. Um, let's see. I want to talk about how to get some of your other films, but just one more question about the Wayne Collins film. Um, just sort of general, what are some of the most surprising things that you learned in this process? Oh, geez. Um, well, you know, there's been so little done on Wayne Collins. I, there's, you know, everything surprised me. Uh, I, I knew some from a, a talk that his son gave at the Tulili Cup pilgrimage, and that was what got me going. It was just fascinating. The, the, the conflict between Collins and the National ACLU, which I always thought was, you know, they were good guys, right? And the National JCL, the details of that whole conflict are fascinating because it really caused a lot of problems for Collins. Um, and hence the reason that it took him 23 years because of a, a lawsuit that was filed by a very um, respected attorney, um, A.L. Warren, who was a Southern California ACLU attorney. Um, and that particular conflict is so fascinating um, that you have to see the film to get the detail of it, but it, 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 it was something that was unimaginable that two attorneys could cause so much problem for each other. Um, and that was something that I learned more about um, as I did the film. The other thing that, just a small thing about Collins that I think was fascinating was that he had a very troubled childhood. He was orphaned when he was nine, I think. He spent five years in an orphanage in you know one of these San Francisco orphanages. Um, and, so, and the rest of his childhood was, was in a boy's home. So the fact that he, came out of that particular um, environment to become the person he was, was just amazing. Because I think he, you know, he really, he went to night law school. He didn't even get a high school degree. There was a little conflict about that. We're not sure if he, I, I checked and they, they didn't have a degree on file for him. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, we're not real sure because there's conflicting information about that. But anyway, he didn't, he never graduated from high school. Uh, but the, and he went to night law school, which you could do back then. And uh, so coming from an orphanage, from a troubled childhood, I, I think that was maybe part of his, his, the drive, you know, what motivated him to, because he really understood being the underdog and not getting treated well. So um, that was great to, to hear that about, you know, how this man came to be. Mm, yes, that certainly must have been part of his driving <clears throat> resolution. Well, thanks, Sharon. Um, I understand that you have copies of some of your other films that you want to make available for free. <laughs> That's correct. I, and I don't know how you want to do that. So perhaps you want to share a little information. Uh, absolutely. I, you know, it's funny because I was trying to figure out how, how do I do this? Cause I, you're, there's an audience out there that I can't see. And, and, and since this is being taped, I, I imagine there might be people after this particular evening that might still want to request it. So I did, figure out that I, I have a brand new website. It's real hard to remember, SharonYamato.com. <laughs> and there is a comment section in the website. So if you go to the comment section and you give me your name and your address, um, and I have two different DVDs. I'm not offering the Wayne Collins ones for free yet, but I have um, a supply of moving walls and I also have a supply of uh, the Michi Wagelin film um, that are sitting in my garage and I'd love for people to see it rather than be sitting in my garage. So if you want to uh, want copies, all I'm asking is that you leave your name and mailing address 
and email address too. I think that might be automatic, but your mailing address for sure. And I'll be happy to send you one or two. You know, tell me which one you prefer if you'd like, you know, one or the other, and let me know. And and hopefully I'll you know, I get to share them with you. Very kind, very kind. <laughs> um, well, I think that's gonna do it for us. And I just I want to thank you for telling us about all of your projects. We're really excited about the new Wayne Wayne Collins film. Um, in particular, and thanks to Kimiko and the Tadayama team for giving us this space. So. Uh, absolutely, thanks, Kimiko. I really appreciate. You know, this is really a a, a treat to be able to talk so much. And mm -hmm. I also want to really deep thanks to Aaron Shigaki, who is my bud and sis. And you know, we I I think that it's our job as Japanese Americans to help each other. And I think we're pretty good at that, aren't we, Erin? So I'm happy that you were the one to suggest this and give me a chance to talk about my latest project. So thanks to you and thanks to Kimiko. I really appreciate it. And I didn't get to ask you any questions. Not this time. Take care, everybody. See you again. Thanks.